from Think Place, which is about public strategy policy design. In short, is the easiest way to put it up. Um, Darren, do you want to kick things off? Thank you. Um, thank you, everybody. So um, my name is Darren Menachemson. Um, I'm a principal at Think Place. And we're about uh, uh, 20 to 30 uh, designers, mostly in Canberra, um, other places around the world. And we work almost exclusively doing design for the government, public service. Sometimes we work with NGOs. So that's, that's my first title. My second title is about the Think Place Foundation, and that's our philanthropic arm. Uh, we do development and aid work um, across the world, uh, particularly Africa and uh, Southeast Asia. And today uh, I wanted to talk a bit about design as a source of empowerment, not just for the communities that government is trying to affect, but also for the government itself, how it empowers people to make decisions and think in a different way. And I'm going to try and draw those two worlds of the foundation and, and our consultancy together into, into one story. So we'll see how I go. But to start, maybe I should try and talk about what on earth I mean by things like a design or service design. When I think about the design work that we do, it's about a community that's going on a journey. That journey isn't a journey about how they interact with government. It's a journey about something much more important to themselves. It's about their life, all the things that they experience over time. And sometimes in your life, you will interact with government services. Maybe something has gone wrong or something has gone right. But whatever it is, whether you're um, a new parent or maybe um, you're uh, uh, facing unemployment, um, there are services that the government offers. And in your interaction with them, um, you'll have an experience. And that experience is either going to be good, it's going to be bad, maybe it's going to be neutral. But you will experience those services. But what do we mean by services? Well, when I think about services, I think about a picture that probably gets a bit more complicated. Sure, people are interacting, but they're interacting just with the facade, the surface layer of government. They're experiencing maybe some of the channels. Um, they're experiencing maybe a call centre, but there's a lot more going on underneath the surface of that service. There's lots of roles deep within the organisation, from the policy makers to the compliance officers, right up to the frontline staff. Um, there are processes that you will never know and never see that are happening in the background that are creating that emergent experience for you. Um, there are information tools and systems, some of which you might touch through the web, some of which you might, again, never know about. Um, there is a lot of information. There is legislation which guides how that service operates and forms a context for um, what it can do, what it can't do, and maybe the policy intent of what it should do. And of course, broader than any government or any one community, there are those socio-cultural norms that say, for us, for this community or this country, or this is what we think is right, and this is what we think isn't right. It's a complex pl place to do design. And I wish there was a single playbook that said, if you're working in the public service or working in the, with the public sector, this is how you do it. But there is no single playbook. And you know, that's probably not a bad thing because lots of organisations have particular ways of approaching design of services and experiences for citizens that are quite innovative and are very suitable for their local agency context. But if there was a playbook, here are the three things that I'd like to see in it. So one is getting a very, very good understanding of the community you're trying to affect and there's ways of doing that. Another one is iteration and experimentation failing to succeed, um, as uh, John so neatly put it um, in, in some of his slides earlier on today. Um, and the third one would be about thinking about change, not just as the bit of the system you're changing, but seeing the whole system and working out the bit that you change and how it forms part of a dynamic ecosystem and thinking about that ecosystem. And um, so this is, this is a photo of a piece of work we were doing quite recently. Um, which was a pretty major system that was targeting uh, very vulnerable people in the population. Uh, before we went out and started to do ethnographic reviews and then came back in and did an iteration and experimentation and took it back out again for testing and went through that whole design life cycle, we knew exactly what we were going to be making. By the time we finished, we knew that what we thought we were going to be making wasn't going to work and we also knew what to make that it was going to work. And um, I just imagine what happens if we hadn't gone through that process 
Um, would we have been empowered to make the decisions? Would we have been able, had the strength to support decisions that we suspected might be right? Um, or would we have had to um, uh, pull back? Now, I'm going to come back to Australia. But first, I want to just do a quick detour to Uganda. So um, uh, late last year, um, I was down in Uganda uh, as part of a foundation project, um, working with a pretty major um, NGO uh, that uh, people would probably recognize the name of in the microfinancing world. And um, this is what we were doing. Your grandfather is ill, and you live in a village in Uganda. Your grandfather lives 100 kilometers north of you. 100 kilometers in Uganda is roughly the distance between the Earth and the Moon in terms of your ability to make that distance in the travel. So what do you do if your grandfather needs medicine? Five years ago, the answer would be very different from the one that you'd get today. Uh, five years ago, the answer would be nothing or a long, arduous journey. Today, you walk up to, um, to a person sitting behind a counter like that and you take out your old mobile phone, just like the one you threw away in 1997, and you say, I'd like to make a deposit. And the person takes your money, and they pull out their phone, and they SMS your bank, uh, the telco, um, your bank account number, and say, this is how much is going in. It's all just one SMS. And uh, they take your money, and then your phone gets an SMS saying, you just had a deposit. And then that person puts the deposit underneath the counter. And then in the village 100 kilometers away, your grandfather goes up to a very similar table. Um, sometimes they're made of wood and they're fancy like that. Sometimes there'll be a cardboard box with a telco written on it. Um, and they will repeat the process in reverse because then you can transfer money across. It's transformative. One fifth of the economy of Uganda moves through that system, which didn't exist seven years ago. Um, but it's all basic services, and banking services are incredibly important to beating poverty. So, oh, well, I'm not going there yet. So, um, what we were trying to do was to say, well, let's actually think about how can you use those mobile phones and SMS in what's actually an incredibly complicated uh, uh, political and social and prudential environment to, um, to help people save, to help people access their community to get microloans to support their businesses or to support school fees. Um, I met this guy uh, quite early in my trip. Um, he had how many children? He had 29. 29 children. Um, three wives, so that's probably okay. 29 children. His biggest social challenge was school fees. So, you know, it's basic stuff that that type of savings and learning is financing. Um, so we did a lot of it. Like, I won't go into the full story about what we did because I just didn't have time today, but what we saw both in what we were doing and working with the NGO, we were seeing a way in which the design was empowering the organisation and was just threaded through every single decision and every single approach that they had. And I'd like to reflect on what we were seeing and doing there in Uganda and see what lessons we can take away about empowering government in Australia. So it's a bit of an experiment. We'll see how we go. Um, when I was on the plane flying into Uganda, I was sitting next to this guy and we struck up a conversation and it turned out that he was actually a, uh, he had two jobs. No, sorry, he had one job, two bits. The first bit was health policy writer. The second bit was occasionally for a few weeks, a few times a year, he'd go out into the field and he'd actually visit villages, see how programs were going, start to understand what health challenges were. This wasn't clever job design, there just weren't enough people to do both of those, so unfortunately for him, he found himself having to do all of it. But, you know, when you speak to someone who's got authority about policy creation, and you can have a conversation with them where they're talking about the faces of the people who's, who's being affected by that policy, there's suddenly something very powerful happening, and I think the reflection was, even though that was a piece of accidental organisational design, what if people who were working in the public sector had to take a couple of weeks off to go and do in situ research or, you know, be on the front line so that when they came back they were, in, oh, they were empowering their policy with all of that storytelling and all of that um, insight that you get from being out there? If not a few weeks, what about a week? If not a week, what about a day? Um, and I think what the conversation I had is one that would be brilliant to have in, in Australia. Um, the organisation we were working with spent several months in the field um, 
working with villagers, and we, when we were there, we were doing the same thing, um, trying to understand some of the very um, distinct and, and uh, complicated dynamics, both financial and social, that exist in villages. Um, complex dynamics which you would miss entirely, but if you didn't know about them, you could actually damage the village infrastructure. For example, it's very easy for a banking service delivered by mobile to destroy um, the social network that's created by a village um, um, tiny kind of informal um, loan enterprises that get set up there. So um, that's, again, just like in the first story I told about um, Australia, you would never want to launch a service without knowing everything that you learned from that deep ethnographic research and understanding the stories and social complexities. For example, okay, here's one. Um, if you, um, if someone walks up to you and says, I want to borrow some money, and you need that money and you're in a village to buy seeds for your farm, um, you can't really say no. It's just, it's just a cultural thing. You just can't say no. But if you create a savings app on the mobile, one of those old mobiles, and it has a tiny disincentive to stop you from withdrawing. That's strong enough for you to break culture and say, actually, I can't do it. Like, that's actually a very powerful insight, and it comes down to the fundamentals of whether or not something is going to succeed. There are hundreds of insights like that, but you would never know it if you hadn't done this work. <laughs> Another insight is, um, is that this is actually much shorter than one, <laughs> than one might uh, imagine. Um, Okay, I'm going to run through some of these quite quickly because I think I've got about four or five minutes left. Someone's going to nod at me at some stage. Um, sharing user intelligence. Every Monday morning, the whole organization came together and they shared everything that they learned about the user. Also, um, a brief went out saying, here's what we learned this week. Here's a persona. This is the example of what we're seeing from, um, from our research. The IT people know who they're delivering for in the community the finance people, the HR people, the business process people, the, everyone. Imagine an organization where everyone was fluent in the community context. Well, I've been to that one, and it's pretty amazing to have conversations there. So my reflection is, how does government achieve that? How do we target the mission of agency for every single person in the agency towards our understanding of who we're trying to deliver for and their real stories? Uh, describing complex concepts with pictures, um, very complicated environment. You can write a 30-page document describing some of the aspects of the solution that were being created and no one would ever read it. But you know, people get a one-pager and they'll take away a sense of what it means. And um, both us and them were using that extensively so we quite enjoyed that interaction. Um, first day I was there, um, I had to walk past about five of these on my way to the office. There are big holes in the pavement. So here's two features. One is, they're just big enough to walk in and fall down. Two, there are no street lights. Three, I left after dark each night. So, uh, oh, four, there was a person sitting next to me who had their leg in the cast. And when I asked how it happened, he said, well, the first night I was walking back and I fell into one of those and my leg actually went kind of up like that and it snapped. Um, slowly but surely, I came to the conclusion that I should carry a flashlight. Um, so do we know what, do we know local context enough to know how we need to operate and design environments to make sure we're working well with the community? Um, first day I was there, it was also the first day of the Ebola outbreak. Um, we were doing ethnographic research in villages, kind of, they were a little bit too close to the epicenter, but what the heck, we, we went and did it anyway. I'm okay, you can shake my hand later, it's, you know, it's, um, I'm still here. Um, but. Um, Understanding the um, response to that from a medical perspective was quite instructive in understanding the type of solution we were creating. For example, it took quite a long time for us, them to get food to the outbreak. How am I going, by the way? Two minutes? Great. Um, patients with Ebola were having demonstrations because they weren't getting fresh food. So, like, you have a set of expectations about the community you're designing for, but if you're actually in the community, you can start to understand that the system may be not as sophisticated or maybe even more sophisticated than you think. And that was a lesson, a very instructive lesson for us, seeing how that played out. Um, the last point I'd like to make is committing to transparent and reusable patterns. Whenever um, this organization does something, not only do they make that pattern available to every other office across the globe, and there are quite a few of them, they also make it available online, open source, so that anyone can pick it up and start to think about how they can use it to improve their community. What if government, reflecting on that, made every pattern that they knew? 
open source uh, for not just Australian jurisdictions, not just NGOs, but maybe overseas as well. Um, so what a fantastic idea. Um, this is my last slide. Um, and I guess as designers, we have to play many roles. Sometimes we're a traffic cop. Um, as Erin Keane, a, a, a lexicographer, sometimes says about her work in the, the lexicographical field, sometimes she's a traffic cop, sometimes we're a traffic cop. We say, no, you can't do that, but you can't do that. Sometimes we're a fisherman, we cast our nets out, and we're not quite sure what we're going to find, but that net of design brings back insights and we can use that to build innovation. Sometimes we're a curator looking out at what's already been done and bringing it back in and saying, here are some amazing things that we can use to drive innovation. Sometimes we're an experimenter, we're going to fail because we know ultimately that failure is going to lead to a success. And sometimes, and it's maybe my favorite role, we're a guide. Um, when I talk about empowering communities and the organization, I think when we think about empowering the organization, designers shouldn't just be thinking about empowering designers. We should be thinking about how every single person in the organization can benefit from the insights and also the process that design implies and slowly but surely use design as a lever to change the culture of the organization and the sector. Thank you very much. <laughs>